Father, we come to you again on this Lord's Day. We just thank you for this day you've given us here to just come and worship you. We thank you, Lord, for all the things that you do in our lives, those things that we just take for granted. We, we, we neglect to thank you for even the so-called little things of just being able to breathe and just being able to see and just being able to just uh, read your word, Lord, and hear your word and to worship you. We, we, we take these things for granted, Lord. And, and Father, uh, pray that we might all just get closer to you, Lord, as the, as the time is keeps getting closer and closer and near to the time of your return. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless each and everyone that's here and those who are listening online. We pray that you may touch the hearts of anyone that's not saved, that may be listening, that you can victim, that today might be the day of their salvation. We pray, Lord, that you may give your servant the words to be spoken. And just, Father, just uh, allow me to teach what needs to be said. Give me the understanding of um, what, need, you know, that, Make sure that I, I have, give me the proper understanding and teaching so that I can teach these people the, the proper things that are found here in Revelation. And so, Father, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be continuing our study in Revelation. This will be Revelation part 11. And we looked at, um, we're going to be picking it up in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, but I want to just... We were looking at verse 18 last week, and we saw where Jesus was saying that, that he that liveth and was dead and is alive forevermore, you know, that he has the keys of hell and death and so forth, that, that um, you know, and I said that, you know, this is one that you could use for Jehovah's Witnesses or so forth that shows you that Jesus is alive. You, you know, remember, he is God. But as I said, he was a man. So as a man, you know, he died. But yet he rose again on that third day. You know, as we just uh, celebrated last week, as Resurrection Day, that we see that Jesus rose again on that third day. So, you know, he, he is alive forevermore. As I said before, the Roman Catholics, you know, they want to crucify him each and every, you know, every day in mass around the world. But Jesus said, you know, that he... He died and he's alive forevermore. You know, he's not going to, he doesn't keep dying. He's alive. He died that once, but now he's alive to stay alive. And I said, you know, keep him, remember that he does have the key, keys to hell and death, which I said, that's going to take place. We're going to see that come into play later on in, in uh, the book, you know, in Revelation as we continue to study it. But just remember that, you know, when the, an angel will get a key from there. From, you know, that Jesus will give this angel a key to open up the bottomless pit to, to allow these locust-type creatures to come out. But remember, you know, whoever has the key is in control. You know, I've heard somebody say that, you know, like in prisons or something like that, you know, they'd gone to a prison and, you know, they'd go through all these doors and so forth. And then they said, you know, they didn't feel too uh, scared because they knew that the person they were with had the keys. You know, where the prisoners are in there, they don't have the key to get out. They're stuck in there. You know, that, you know, whoever has that key is the one that's in control. You know, and Jesus as the creator is clearly the one in control. Well, let's go ahead and pick it up here now in verse 19. So Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Jesus tells John to write the things that he has already seen. And those he was seen, as well as the things he will see later on. You know, Jesus is confirming that John is an eyewitness to everything that is written in this book. These were not dreams, visions, or something John made up, but rather actual things that John saw. And remember, he's telling them to write the things that you have, you know, that seen and, and you know, which are and so forth that, you know, hereafter. All the things that he sees that he has already seen, that he is seeing, and he will see, he's to write down. But he's only to write down what he has seen, or as we'll see later on, you know, what he's heard. But 
But it, you know, these he's an eyewitness to these things that you know God supernaturally took him to the future, and he's seeing the things that's going to happen in, in in the tribulation and so forth, or you know during all these different time periods, you know the millennium and so forth that we'll see. But you know these were you know G, John actually saw these things again. They were not dreams. He didn't just you know he doesn't add his own things like well yeah I saw this you know I saw a bunch of you know like you know, whatever, you go a compound disaster, you know, a big earthquake or something, and you're like, okay, yeah, I saw all these buildings topple. I saw, you know, a big hole in the earth. I saw this. Thing. And then you're like, well, but that doesn't make it good enough. So let me add a little bit, you know, so John tries to make it, you know, sound better or whatever. You know, John didn't do anything. He only put in here what he saw. And, you know, he didn't go by, you know, what, well, I was describing this earthquake, and then you had these people telling you, well, this is what I saw. Well, if John didn't see it, he doesn't care what this other person saw. He's only putting down what he saw, you know. So that's very important because, you know, John was that was an eyewitness, and, and so it, it, you know we know that these things are real. They're not something that um, you know is made up or something like that. So you know this is going to be very important throughout this whole study to keep that in mind. But let's look at the uh, final verse of. The chapter here, look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, and we're going to see this is going to give us the meanings of what we saw earlier in this chapter. So Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So Jesus concludes the chapter by telling John what the seven stars and the seven golden candlesticks are that he was shown earlier. As I said earlier in the study, if something is meant to be symbolic, then God will always tell us somewhere in Scripture what the symbols mean, and that is what Jesus does in this verse. You know, sometimes, like in this case here, you know, this was back in... Uh, uh, what verse 16 I think it was where he's describing these things where John first saw them you know and then here it is four verses later he tells us what the meanings are that you know sometimes it's it, you know could be in this you know the same verse or you know it's it's nearby but other times like we'll see later on in chapter 12 where it talks about the, the 12 stars and all that stuff that you got to go all the way back to Genesis to find those and things you know so it goes from the first book to the last book that that but, you know, somewhere in Scripture, usually, you can find the meaning of these things if you look at other places where those words are used. Like, for example, stars. We know that stars in other places are describing angels. So, you know, we can put these things together. You can kind of figure some of these things out, even if it doesn't specifically explain it. You know, like sometimes it'll, it'll spell it out directly like this. But even if it does not... <laughs> You can usually, you can tell it's being used symbolically, and then it'll, you can tell you that, um, you know, like there's one time where it talks about a star fell from heaven upon the earth. Well, if a whole, if a literal real giant star fell on the earth, it would totally obliterate. You know, the stars are much bigger than, than the earth. That You know, we know that it's referring to an angel, but, you know, so like I said, you just need to compare scripture with scripture, but, you know, somewhere... God tells us, you know, in his word, you know, if something's meant to be uh, taken symbolically. You know, otherwise, as I said, you always need to make sure you take it literally. You know, and, that, and that's always been the problem. I've, I've heard even a lot of pastors say that, well, you know, like, you know, it talks about the giants in Scripture and so forth. And, and it talks about someone being as tall as trees. Well, there's nothing in Scripture that says someone were not as tall as trees. Why should we take that? Symbolically, there's nothing in there to show that it wasn't. So it's certainly possible that some of them were as tall as cedar trees or whatever. So, you know, I think we need to learn to take scripture, as I said, literally, even if we did not understand it all, regardless of, you know, what are we, it, it just doesn't, it's hard for us to boggle in our minds to comprehend and say, wow, how can they be that tall or this, that, you know, unless we're told otherwise, we need to, to take it literally. Now, Jesus also says the seven golden candlesticks that John saw are the seven churches. Now, there is much debate over who the angels refer to, whether they are literal angels 
or the pastors of the churches. Now many say that an angel cannot a book or uh, uh, say, many say that an angel cannot get a book or letter from John, so they must be the pastors. But you know that that's not true. Um, you know, here again, we go back to what I, I, I said and take the scripture literally unless we are told otherwise. And here Jesus himself, himself defines the stars as angels and not pastors. You know, these are literal angels who protect the church. You know, so again, you know, I already told you that there's other places in scripture that stars and angels, you know, angels are referred to as stars. There's no other place in Scripture where angels are referred to as pastors. And the word pastor is used elsewhere in Scripture. So there's no reason why, you know, it would, in this case, refer to a pastor. You know, there's nothing to, to justify making this pastors. That You know, these are literal angels, at least in my opinion. You know, just as believers have an angel over them, then churches also have an angel over them. You know, we're told, you know, Jesus said that, you know, that the little children, you know, they're angels in heaven, look over them. And, uh, you know, we know governments also have angels over them, and the same applies also to evil angels. Daniel 10 shows how governments have good and excuse me, Daniel 10, chapter 10, shows how governments have good and evil angels over them. And there are other places in Scripture where angels are referred to as stars, including here in Revelation, as Satan in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, takes a third of the stars in heaven, or a third of the angels with him in rebellion against God. You know, obviously he's not talking about literal stars here, he's talking about the angels. So, you know, that's why even the Freemasons, that's why, you know, they have 33 degrees, is because it represents the one-third of uh, the fallen angels that, that, you know, rebelled, or the angels that rebelled with with uh, Satan and became the, the evil angels. But we'll look at that first in a minute here, but, um, you know, as I said, so we, we know that angels not only are over believers and over governments and stuff, but why would they not then be over the church? I mean, the church is the bride of Jesus. If they can be over governments, you do not think that Jesus would not have angels to you know, be over, especially those churches that are godly churches where they have a, a godly uh, pastor that's preaching the word, you know, especially out of, like the King James Bible, and you know that that, it, that the the people are, are out there trying to win souls and living for the Lord and stuff like that. You know, Jesus is going to have an angel over those churches. Now, that doesn't mean that there's, there's evil angels there too. You know, they want to go around. You know, Satan wants to stop the preaching of godly men. That's why he tries to stir up problems in the church or, you know, oftentimes that's why pastors own children are, re are very rebellious, especially if it's a pastor that's very much trying to serve the Lord <clears throat> because Satan wants to stop and destroy that man's ministry. So, you know, Satan will go and send people to, you know, try to stir things up, you know, wolves of sheep's clothing or fight or attack his children or, or do whatever it takes to try to destroy that man's ministry. But, you know, we need to remember that, you know, Scripture says that the father's not responsible for the sins of the children, and the children's not responsible, you know, for the, for the son, and the son's not responsible for the, for the uh, sins of the father. So, you know, don't, don't judge the, uh, the pastor because of his rebellious children. That, uh, you know, they're, they're going to have to deal with a lot more because, like I said, when you're trying to preach for the Lord, you're going to find out. If anybody that ever tries to live for the Lord, you're going to find out that you're going to get far more attacked by Satan than people that are not. So it's always easy to say, you know, criticize them or whatever. But, you know, so again, I think my opinion, I think Scripture is showing you that these are literal angels here. That, you know, we know that it is and say that, that uh, you know, John could not give them a letter or a book, you know, in this case, you know, the, the revelation we're talking about here you know to a literal angel that's not true jesus 
is giving him all these visions. He's seen angels and, and, and so forth that he could allow him for that time. Like, okay, here's the he, that guy over there. He, he's actually the angel. He's really an angel. He's not really a man. Remember, they look just like men whenever they came here to earth. So he could tell, you know, John wouldn't necessarily know. You know, it says you sometimes entertain uh, strangers unawares that they're really angels. But yet he, God gave him all these things. He could have said, okay, go here to, you know, F, or whatever, send this one or, you know, whatever. That, that That's really an angel. And so they get these books, you know, I mean, they get Revelation in the letter here. And, um, you know, we know that angels could physically, you know, they eat, they eat man. Man is referred to as angels food. You know, they have physical bodies, you know, that uh, they don't have a physical body in our sense. You know, they have a, it's a spiritual body. It's like God's, Jesus' glorified body where they could still walk through walls and do things like that. But it's still a body that can be touched. You know, they could go and touch the angels. They could, you know, a lot when those angels came. They, you know, they could touch the angels. They could eat the, the angels, you know, all these things that, that um, so, you know, that's just kind of foolish to say that we could not, you know, give them you know, this book or whatever that, you know, so it must be real pastors. And, you know, we're going to see that some of the, these churches here were not all the best churches as we go through them. So, you know, in this case here, then, you know, I'm not totally blaming the pastor, but because sometimes it's just the pastor could do everything and the people just do not want to listen or whatever. But, you know, anyway, like I said, I just think scripture, there's more evidence for showing them that the stars that it refers to as angels. And plus, like I said, Jesus himself is calling them angels. You know, why didn't he just stand in this case here? When he, I mean, the whole point of this thing, what Jesus is saying in the first, he's, he's describing you, you know, he described him as stars and seven golden candlesticks. And then now he's telling you that was just being symbolic. This is what they really mean. So if he's going to break it down now to what it really means, he would have said the seven stars are the seven pastors. He wouldn't have said seven angels because then now he's still leaving it as um, being symbolic or, or uh, you know, it, it mean, I'm not an angel. I'm a pastor. And so, you know, to me, it's, you know, Jesus would not really be, he'd be still leaving it as, quote, a mystery by if he really meant pastors, then he would have said pastors. He wouldn't have said angels because he's still leaving it as being symbolic of pastors. And the whole point is he's trying to break down the symbolism here, showing you what the true meaning of it is with the candlesticks being the churches and so forth. So, you know, I just don't buy it that it's uh, referring to, to pastors. But as I said, let's look at that Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, and just take a look at this um, about those angels that rebel with Satan. So Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So if you would turn there, please. So Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered. For to devour her child as soon as it was born. You know, again, it says that through the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. They're all cast to the earth. If these were little stars, you know, first of all, there are, stars aren't in heaven. You know, I mean, they are in heaven in the sense that we have the three heavens, you know, the stars are in the second heaven and so forth. But if, they, if you cast all of these down to earth, the earth would have been literally destroyed. Now, I mean, obviously, it's not talking about literal stars here. So, you know, and we know it's the whole thing is just dealing with, with Satan and his rebellion, you know, fighting against uh, Michael and so forth. So, you know, we know this is referring to, to angels. And then uh, go back to Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. I mean, I'll go ahead and read that. You know, that's just right here in this book. And there's other places in Scripture. We're not going to get into them all because I've mentioned some of that before in previous preaching. But look at uh, Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. Because, you know, this also has a reference of an angel as a star. So Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven under the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now, this, this is what I was talking about before, about getting that key. You know, there's, you know obviously it's referring to an angel. Number one, it, it calls him a him. And so, um, 
you know, it's obviously a person here, you know, a, a, a being or whatever that, you know, a, a literal star cannot open up, you know, you cannot give a key to a literal star and open up a, um, you know, have the keys to the hill to open up, you know, the bottomless pit. So, you know, again, those are just two references there that show you and within the same book how stars refers to literal angels. And as I said a while ago, if the stars were literal pastors, then Jesus would have said so. You know, again, because it, it, it just makes no sense when he's trying to define the symbolism. And then if he still left part of it in symbolism, you know, that, that if he really made a passage, but he still calls them angels, it would still be being then symbolic. You know, he would not have completed. He would only lowered it down to maybe another level, but he would never have really defined what the symbolism truly meant. So, you know, they were not literal. Uh, I mean, they're not they're not pastors. They're, they're talking about. Uh, literal angels. Well, let's move on to chapter 2 here. So let's look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now Jesus tells John to write to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Now, Jesus confirms it is him by saying he is the one who holdeth the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, as we saw in earlier verses. Now, by this statement, Jesus is saying that he is the one who controls the angels and what they do. He also provides them safety against Satan in their duty to protect the church as he holds them in his right hand. You know, that's what he's showing you symbolically. He was showing there that, you know, he had these seven stars in his right hand. Remember what I said uh, about right hand in um, the sermon this morning that, uh, you know, the right hand shows it's, it's your power side or that's your, your uh, the one that's in control, the authority, that, uh, that you know, the superiority, that, that you know, that anybody that was important always sat, like if you had a meal, they sat on the right hand side of the host. You know, remember, Jesus is seated on the right-hand side of God the Father. You know, that right hand is significant on what, um, you know, but it also shows that security. If you're in the hand of, of Jesus, Satan cannot touch you, you know, not unless Jesus wants to let him or something. But, you know, that shows the security. If you're, you're safely in, if you're in the hand of Jesus, you're, you're, you're secure. But as I said, the right hand is the power hand. Now, Jesus walks among the churches as he said he would be in the midst of two or three believers who gathered in his name. You know, Scripture talks about that and says that, you know, wherever two or three are gathered in his name, then Jesus is in the midst of them. So, you know, it doesn't matter how few you have. You know, if you're just having a family devotional, if you're just having whatever, you're at church or you're just a couple of Christian friends get together and you start something or whatever. Or two or three are gathered in his name, then, you know, then um, Jesus is in the midst. You know, remember, he, uh, you, all, you only needed two or three witnesses for for something, you know, according to the Old Testament. And so, you know, we, right there, they got you two or three witnesses. And, but Jesus will have John write to the angel of each of the seven churches and will give commendations, or will give commendations condemnations and words of what he expects from each of the churches. So we're going to see that John's going to write to each of these seven churches. He's going to be writing to the angel of the church. As I said, I believe that these are literal angels, not the pastors. You know, the, the, the angel's responsibility at that point may be going to then explain these things to the pastor or whatever, but I believe that, you know, that it's still, you know, again, they could take anything, they could take you know, things literally that Jesus, I mean, um, could allow him to whatever means somehow get this letter to these angels or whatever. But the, uh, you know, we, we see there, that, like I said, that he's right, you know, to each one. And each each church we're going to see, for the most part, will get commendations, condemnations, and then, you know, what he expects. So, you know, it kind of breaks it down like, He'll usually say something good about the church. Then 
he'll say, okay, well, this, but you have these problems and then this is how you can fix it. Or, you know, this is what I expect out of you to, you know, to improve yourself. We're going to see there's going to be a couple churches that will not get the condemnation or whatever. But uh, for the most part, you know, this, this pattern will hold through for all seven churches. But let's take a look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. So Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. Now this first starts off with a with I know thy works. Excuse me. Now Jesus says this statement to all seven churches. You're going to see as we look at every seven, all the seven churches, every time he'll start that off with, I know thy works. You know, the fact that he knows the works of the seven churches shows his deity is only he is omniscient. You know, omniscient means all knowing. You know that. Only God can know the works of, you know, even here, you know, you might be good friends with a pastor at some other good church or something, but, or wherever. But you don't know, you don't know the hearts of all the individuals. You don't know everything that really goes on. You know, only God does. And so, but he, you know, and the thing is, all churches have works. They're either good works or bad works or combination. But they all have some type of works, it's just whether they're, as I said, good works or bad works. You know, a lot, you know, some churches have nothing but bad works. So, you know, it, it. But one way or the other, they're going to have some kind of works, and Jesus knows what they are, and that's when He says, you know, He, he says, "I know." So you're not going to hide anything from me, or, you know, you act like you know you're all good. Like we're going to see here that Church of Ephesus, for the most part, was pretty good. But we're going to see He does going to have some condemnation for him. So, but Jesus continues. By saying he knows the labor and patience of the church at Ephesus and how they cannot bear those who are evil. You know, that, that's a good thing. You know, we should not, you know, like the, the evil. You know, there's people in the church, there's a lot of them that, you know, Jesus said to kind of wipe your feet of them or get away from them. That, that uh, you know, they want to push evil and so forth. You know, and even some are true Christians, but they, uh, you know, they're just always stirring up the brethren or just, you know, being negative all the time or something like that, you need to just get away from them. You know, if they're if they're trying to, um, like I said, stop good preaching from being done, or, or if they're trying to, uh, you know, whatever their their means are, if they, if it's not pleasing to the Lord, you know, we just, you know, we should not be happy with those things. You know, so you know, and and the Church of Ephesus was not. So you know, God was saying that's a good thing, but Jesus says the church has tried or tested those who say they are apostles. And have found them to be liars. Now the church was right in calling out the false teachers, as they were only to cause division. They were only there to cause division in the church. You know, and again, that a wise church will do that things. You know, you see the false teachers and so forth that that uh, you know we need to call them out. You know, if there's people in there that come in the church and they want to teach pro, uh, false things or so forth. You know, we need to call them out, you know, that, that uh, you know, so, you know, this was another thing that God was condem uh, com commending them on, that this, you know, this was a good thing. And so, you know, we, we see that, you know, they were calling them liars, you know, that, I mean, you know, remember the church of Ephesus, you know, I broke it down to each church. Remember, they're all at the same time period, but each one represents a different time period within the church age. And. The Church of Ephesus represented the apostolic age of when the apostles were all there. Because you remember, we're going to see that Paul started this church. But the, uh, you know, there were still people that claimed that they were apostles or different things like that at this time. So, you know, because remember, John's still alive. And he was one of the apostles. And so others are like, you know, that they're apostles and so forth. And that... Um, Excuse me. So, you know, but these people recognized that they were false teachers. And so, you know, they, they called them out for what they were. They called them out and said they were liars. You know, those people like that, they're just people like that, the wolves, the sheep's clothing that, that Satan sends in just to try to divide churches and so forth. You know, Satan's good at that. He'll try to, if, if a church isn't really preaching a whole lot, I'm not saying that there's not any saved people there or whatever, but if they're not 
doing a whole lot. They're just pretty much milk Christians, carnal Christians, worldly Christians, and so forth. And they don't say a whole lot about the gospel. They don't go out and try to win souls or whatever. They're just kind of there and they show up. Satan's not going to bother those type of churches too much. You know, but if you've got a, a man that's in there preaching God's word, and especially using the King James Bible, which is really it's kind of hard to preach the word if you don't really have a King James Bible. But the, uh, you know, when they're using all these counterfeit Bibles and so forth like that, but if you have a man that's in there preaching what needs to be said, you know, Satan wants to go hard after those kind of churches. And that's why, you know, it's so hard to find a good godly King James Bible preaching church today because Satan wants to go after those kind of places. And so, you know, it's just, it's, um, you know, we be, need to be aware of those false teachers and people like that coming in. But Jesus, as I said, commends them for these things as we should always make sure our leaders are who they say they are. Now they are righteous and having patience and doing good works. Now these were all good things that Jesus said about Ephesus. You know, so, you know, he did have some good things to say about them. And I said this while ago, but I said the church at Ephesus was started by Paul. And history says John became the pastor after he was released from Patmos. Now, Scripture does not say that, so we don't know that for sure. According to history, once he was, remember, he was writing on the Isle of Patmos when he wrote Revelation. And once he finally got released, you know, about a year later when the um, Caesar had uh, uh, died, uh, Demetrian or whatever his name was, I don't remember now, then, you know, legend, you know, according to history, he was released and then he became the pastor there at Patmos, you know, I mean, uh, became the pastor of uh, <laughs> Ephesus. Now, notice that this first mentions false apostles. You know, this shows that this church represents all the churches of the apostolic age. As I said, all of these churches were really all, you know, they were all churches at the same time. I mean, it wasn't, you know, like, oh, this is one, and then he looks at one later on. I mean, they were literally all seven churches operating at the same time. But remember, I said each one represents a different period. The church of Ephesus is the only one where he talks about the apostles. None of the other churches mention anything about apostles. So again, God's trying to tell us that, that um, you know, because they're, they're the ones that represent the apostolic age. And so I believe that's why they get mentioned in there. Let's look at one more verse here. So let's look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 3. It's Revelation chapter 2, verse 3. And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. So Jesus continues by saying how they have labored and not fainted and have had patience. Now patience of a church is essential if it is going to win souls and grow spiritually. Now the church seems to have continued on the path that was set by them by Paul, and they worked for the Lord. Now this church was very much into doing service or good works for the Lord. You know, so that was a good thing, but we're going to see that this uh, sometimes gets in the way, though, too, if you... If you start doing it for the wrong reasons. And we're going to see that was part of their problem. They weren't necessarily doing bad works, but they weren't necessarily doing them with the right heart. So we're going to, we'll pick it up next week in verse 4, Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. And we'll continue to look at the church of Ephesus, but we're going to stop here for this week. Let's uh, have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to once again study your word on Revelation. We thank you, Lord, for... Each and everything you do, we thank you for your son, Jesus, what you did for us on Calvary. We pray, Lord, that you bless the week. Bless again each one that's here and listening online. Just put a hedge around all of us and your servant. And we just pray, Lord, that you uh, keep us all safe and he uh, healthy and safe. And, and just uh, pray for a safe return on the midweek service. And Father, we just thank you again for all you do. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.